Welcome here to a very special edition of Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. Of course, we are here picture in picture with Joe Adam. You know Joe Adam from back in the day. We met when he was at Syracuse as the offensive line coach. He brought in an entire new offensive line, and then they didn't let him coach a single one of them. And I'm going to say something about that, okay? I think the offensive line would have been better if the person that brought him in got to coach him, but he brought in some good offensive linemen for the Syracuse orange. And he has moved on from there to St. Anselm. He's been the head coach of the St. Anselm Hawks for many years now. And we have been friends for, believe it or not, a decade at this point. I think it's like, yeah, pretty much a decade up to this point. We both, as we've evolved, I've shaved my head down. He keeps his hair short goatee. And it's like, as we become friends for more years, we start to look more and more alike with our haircuts and our decisions on our facial hair. So, Joe, how are you? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. It's been a, a great Friday so far. Uh, started off really early. We have 6.20 practice in the morning on Fridays. Uh, we like to get in and get our work done. And so uh, I'm just really blessed and uh, just glad to be here. Yeah, and happy to have you here. I'm calling it Faith in Football you know, we talk about faith so much. You and I have had so many heart to heart conversations about so many different things and just deeply rooted conversations into uh, into life and into the questions that I think a lot of people ask themselves, ask God in silence and, and don't always talk about it. And I feel like, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to talk about it. Listen, the crazy this is one thing I know about crazy people. They're never afraid to talk. They're never afraid to shout it out. You know, crazy people are never ashamed to put anything out there. So when people are, I'm afraid to talk about God. I'm afraid to talk about the things that bother me or the things that I'm passionate about. I'm afraid to chase my dreams. If a crazy person can put underpants on their head and run around wearing a t-shirt that says I'm a turtle, then you can go out and talk about God today. <laughs> That's right, man. Amen to that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So with that being said, how do you connect faith and football as a head coach all the time? How do you intertwine them to not have to be a different person in two different places? Yeah, you know, it's a really good question. Um, you know, I was talking with my, uh, I, I'm, I'm really privileged to be in a uh, weekly Bible study uh, on Thursday nights with a, gr a group of guys from around the country um, who are probably smarter than me. And, uh, and I've learned a ton and we share a lot of information and a lot of thought process. And, you know, just in, in hopes as a, as a football coach, you know, and, and really my job being, you know, twofold, right. I mean, uh, yes, I'm a football coach. That's what it says on the outside of my door, but like I tell people in recruiting, I'm really a man builder. Yeah. And, you know, I build men with a platform of football. I've done it for over 25, 27 years now. So, um, you know, just trying to be a vessel uh, for for God to come into people's lives. And and it happens in a lot of um, different situations. It happens in situations of success. It also happens in situations of struggle. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we had a we had a situation of struggle um, last weekend. I mean, we played a great football game, lost in the last minute. Uh, everybody was crushed except for me, you know, and so um, I just looked at, and I thought about, you know, and, and and did a quick prayer before I talked to the team and, and said, hey, how do you uh, how do you want me to respond here? How do you want how do you want to use me? And um, and what's the message? And so it's just I was kind of led by the Holy Spirit and um, and I, I was actually really uh, I wasn't down. I was really, um, really proud of the guys and I was really uh, um, positive. And so, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of negativity out there in the world, man. So trying to trying to continue to foster uh, an, an, you know, an environment and, and a daily life of, you know, let's let's, you know, negativity is negative 100 percent of the time. So let's so let's be positive, man. Let's let's not let the things outside of our control control the things that are inside of our control. Yeah, I mean, and that's uh, that's such a great statement to make is why let the outside things control? I mean, the only thing you have in your life that you can control is you. So if you give that up, then you got nothing. And, you know, I, I feel like 
there's days and I had a day this week, Joe, I had a day this week where I was burdened, you know, and I wasn't burdened because I have a bad life and I wasn't burdened because I'm, I'm not healthy. It, it was just this, this feeling I kind of put upon myself of, of feeling low. Right. I was like, I I'm a lover of God. I've always loved God. I'm a romantic person, 37 years old. My birthday's coming up. I'm going to be 38. I thought I'd be married. I thought I'd have kids. So I felt that. And then, you know, I've gone through stuff with my throat and like my muscles. And so I, I got like vocal fatigue because when you're a professional speaker or singer or anything of that nature, I never thought about it like this, but they said, you have to treat your voice like you're a professional singer. They said, you use it as a living. It's your vessel. You have to rest it. You haven't rested it in 19 years. When your voice and you're tired, you keep going. When I had injured, I thought I had injured my vocal cord like five years ago. I talked through it. And they said, so basically you played on a sprained ankle. And so I, I just kind of hit this point earlier on in the week where I was like, God, I don't like that. It feels like I got to get a breath. I don't like that my voice is tired. I don't like that my neck hurts. I don't like that I'm not married. I don't have kids. And I was feeling sorry for myself. And I was like, why is this happening? Like, I'm good to you. I could be a million times better. And Lord knows that. But I'm like, I love you. I'm here for you. My getaway is my career. I love what I do for a living. Every pain I've been through, I just put it in the microphone. Right. Mm -hmm. And so going through that and having that adversity and feeling like, when women that I would date would hurt me, I'd go to the microphone. So now if my voice and different things, if there was stuff that was bothering me here and they're bothering me, it's like, well, everybody's winning. I'm not winning. And I started to feel really down. And then I thought to myself, I'm healthy. I'm healing. It hasn't hindered me from doing my job. I am a better person for leaving the marriage that I was in. I'm healthier to myself. I'm better to myself and I'm better to other people. I have learned to laugh more. I've learned to be more peaceful. This thing with the vocal cords has taught me to rest and taught me to value my rest. I don't feel guilty for taking breaks. So there's all this good that's come from it. And I know there's a message from God, but I bring it up because I think we all kind of feel sorry for ourselves at certain points. And we want to know, like, why is this happening? And I feel like so many people fight with that internally, but they don't voice. And I feel like having a show, what is the point of being a broadcaster if I don't become a voice to the voiceless? And I mm -hmm. think so many times we want to say like, hey, God, I can't control what's happening to me right now. And I'm struggling with it. Can you help me? And I'd love mm -hmm. to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, this is where, uh, you know, a lot of prayer, I think brotherhood and community come in into this space as well you know where you you're around uplifting people that you know understand your struggle and you know and god is using them in different ways and and in trying to reach you and so um you know uh it's when we look at our daily lives you know this is this is hard stuff and some people have a lot harder i mean you know um i'm around over 130 people a day and and they have trials and tribulations and I look at some of my challenges and I'm like, man, I'm trying to move the, uh, the leather football 10 yards here. And, uh, I don't, I don't nearly have some of the challenges that some of these guys are struggling with. So, you know, um, when, when guys come into my office, I just really take some time to, you know, think about, you know, Hey Lord, how, how, how do you want me to respond here? Like how, how should I help this person? And, um, you know, how can I, move it along in the right direction because there's always going to be peaks and valleys like you know, the bible says that you know this this life is not without trials and tribulations yeah. you know being it being a believer is actually harder than being a non-believer in my opinion yeah. um you know because it, it's it's now actually because of how we live and how our world is it's exactly the exact opposite of how our countries and and how our our daily lives are working and so uh it's not popular right? It's not uh, expressive sometimes. And, and so there's people who are, you know, in countries in the world who are living in persecution because of their faith, they have to, yeah. they have to get together in basements somewhere to, to worship. And, um, 
you know, and, and so anytime I, I'm going through a hard day, I, I think about that. I think about people who are, you know, standing in line with, you know, for rice and, you know, well water um, and, and, you know, how rich of a country we live in, in the United States. Yeah. And, you know, we have, yeah, we have challenges. Oh, my, I can't get this because the app doesn't work. I mean, like that's, th those are minimal things. So, you know, we're human beings, Dan, right? And so we we are born from sinful nature. Like we sin every day. I mean, I, we try not to, but we do it. And it's the grace of, that God gives us to uh, to walk in freedom and to walk in peace. Yeah. And it's a relationship as you bring, as you bring Jesus along in your life that uh, and the Holy Spirit that guides you through the peaks and the valleys. And so there's there's not going to be a life without valleys. It's just uh, you know through prayer, through uh, relationship, um, you can get uh, you can get out of that valley. You can get you can break down those strongholds. You can break down the chains that are you know in whatever whatever is holding you back from being the very best version of you. We, we all have bad days. That's where we have grace from God that uh, allows us. And once we understand what that grace is, man, it's such a powerful thing to jump out of the valley, you know, and get to the peak. You say the word grace a lot and the definition of it, I have struggled with fully understanding. How would you define grace? You know, it, it's, it's God's favor, man. It's, it's, you know, grace is just, having this obedience to understand, like, I am, I'm not the master of myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't do life by myself. And every time us as people try to like say, Hey, well, I'll fix it. I'll do it. Uh, I can, I can handle this. We find out that we can't handle it. And that's where, you know, we take our, our, our trials to God and we, we're obedient to it and we walk walk in that in that light and we ask for his grace and we wait on his timing and you know yeah. we live in a society where it's now i want things now you know and that's why i love going to europe because those people are chill man like they're <laughs> like hey you know dinner's going to take 3 hours just relax okay yeah. it's not happening now it's going to taste um, good though yeah it's going to be great and so um we wait on his timing you know some um some prayers are going to be answered sooner than others. And sometimes maybe the answer is no, but it's not always going to happen. And so, but, um, but it's, it's faith that, uh, that brings you into that spotlight. Yeah. You know, I, and I think that I think for me, because in my life, my outlet was, has, has been broadcasting for so long, you know, mm -hmm sharing my thoughts and not being afraid. Like I went to a high school where there were bullies that wanted nothing more, but for me to not speak. And my response was to always speak to, to always, you know, I got to a point in my senior year where I always had my wit, but it came out. And then it was like, now the bullies don't want to talk to me because my wit is just going to come right back. But it, it was, you know, like this has always been an outlet and going through what I've been through this past year with vocal fatigue and like jaw and like throat stuff bothering me. I had a, like a virus that affected my throat. And I was just like, you know, I tell people all the time, you either love it or you think you love it. And I've known I've loved this thing my whole life because I was like, that's what I was thinking about. It was even more than being healthy. It was like, I want to feel good enough to do my show. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even like, God, get me healthy. It was God, get me on the air. And, and, you know, I, I, I feel, I feel like it's so much fun, right? Like, look at what we're doing right now. We're sitting here, we've been friends for a decade and you and I both believe in God. We're unapologetic about it. And we're just, we're just on microphones, right? And we're hanging out and you're not here, but I feel like you are. It's like light a cigar, grab yeah. some, you know, grab something to drink. Let's just hang out. Yep. Like, like COVID was, was such a horrible thing, but it did this. Like, right. it was like, Hey, we have zoom. Hey, we have this. Hey, we have that. Hey, you can FaceTime me, hey, you know, and it, it evolved my business. You know, I mean, we, we took all of our logos and I, I said to my one buddy I went to college with, there's a graphic de designer, John Grenquist, shout out to him. I said, John, I'm an opportunistic guy. 
we got time right now. We're sitting in the middle of a pandemic. I want to make all my logos better. Let's do it. Let's do this all now. So that people are going to see evolution and they're going to see positivity. They're going to see a beacon of hope in the middle of this darkness. And we're going to have a good time with it. And we did exactly that because John's awesome. And, you know, I look at our friendship and I, I look at this, right? I don't give you a rundown of things we're going to talk about. I don't do that with anybody. I'm just like, Joe, we're going to, we're going to rep. We're going to have fun. Like I want people to feel like they're just sitting on a couch, hanging out with us, laughing with us, having a good time with us. And that to me is what it's all about. You talked about being overseas and I'm going to throw this at you. Mm -hmm. I haven't been to Italy and I haven't been to Spain. Now I just had my 20 year high school reunion and I tested my theory that I thought was correct. And I said to one of the girls, I'm like, I'm Italian and Hispanic. And she goes, we all thought you were hundred percent Italian. I'm like, yeah, because I live a George Lopez life. And my dad doesn't tell me anything until he accidentally tells me or somebody else tells me. So I didn't know how I was Hispanic until I was a teenager because my grandmother said something. And so she's like, yeah, none of us knew. And I was like, you wouldn't know. Cause my father didn't tell me for no reason. And so now that I know that I'm Italian and Hispanic, I want to go back and I want to see my family. Now I've mm -hmm. connected with my family in Spain. I, I haven't connected with anybody in Italy yet, but my dad and I've been talking about going to Italy for, I don't even know, like a decade. And my dad said to me, he goes, April. He said, I'm going to wait till everything's done. I'm going to wait till NCAA tournament's done. All your work is done as far as your travel. And we're going to go to Italy. So we're going to Italy. That's so the awesome, reason why, man. The, thank you. The reason why I bring that up is because I don't mind dinner taking three hours because I'm from an Italian family. The That's other great. reason why I bring that up is because I hear that women overseas still value men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I feel like I, I keep looking up at God going, if you're waiting for me to go overseas, I'm going to do it. And, you know, but it I, happens I, when you least expect it, buddy. Let, let me tell you something. Okay. I'm always going to be a hope, hopeful romantic. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I, I can't even say that I expect it. I'm always going to be a romantic. So that's always in my head. But Joe, I don't expect anything from dating anymore. The only thing that I expect, you know, let me, let me rephrase. The only thing I expect from dating is more valuable comedy material for me to tour the world. There is nothing that I gain from dating a woman now, except for reminding myself why I don't. <laughs> it's so like, and I'm sure women feel that way about men. I'm speaking from my point of view. But you know what I realized, Joe, that I didn't realize before? I have no idea how much money I've been saving not going on dates and having a girlfriend for over a year. I did not realize. I took a girl on four dates. cost me $200. I mm -hmm. was like, I better marry this girl or break up with her now because that's mm -hmm. money that I shouldn't have spent. $200, Joe. Dinner. <laughs> yep. Dinner time. She bought me muffins. I go, you, you gotta, you're going to have to buy me about... 17 more boxes of these muffins to make up for dinner. <laughs> uh, so you're about to celebrate a monumental time with your wife. So let me live vicariously through you. Sure. As I continue to see crazy, you continue to have a loving, caring, wonderful wife. And I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm not surrounded by love folks. I'm surrounded by more love than I can count, but I want to celebrate the fact you have an anniversary coming up. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, yep, next um, next June uh, we have a we have a nice trip planned. We're we're still talking about the destination, but um, it's uh, it's been such a blessing, man. I really uh, it's been you know next to my faith, it's been the most important thing to me. Yeah. Uh, th there's really one person I really want to see at the end of the game. That's my wife. It's the most important uh, relationship that I have, you know, on the on the earth, next to my mother and and some of my family members. So. Yeah. Um, you know, I tell, I tell, you know, the cool part about being a college football coach is you, you get these stories from the guys and you're like, all right, Hey, I'm going out with this girl and Hey, why do you like her? And we just kind of chop it up a little bit. Right. And, yeah. you know, and dating, obviously it's just so different. And, and I'll tell you what, man, rejection is different, man. And guys, guys really don't know how to handle it when the relationship ends. And I've seen it really affect their athletic performance. So that kind of where I step in and, um, and, and kind of be a mentor to them. And so, um, it's, um, you know, just trying to, to show them what, what a loving marriage is, you know, I've, I've been able to take my wife on a couple of the road trips and I just want them to see me, you know, they, they see the hard level Joe Adam, 
you know, serious all the time, wants to win, ultra competitive. Uh, they need to see the the you know the husband side of me too. Yeah. You know, trying to model the the right things to our guys about what a loving relationship is, what a real relationship is, what it means when you're, you know, when you have faith at the cornerstone of your of your relationship. And um, and that's really been the the you know what's grown here in Manchester for for Lisa and I. And uh it's been it's been the foundation, man, the, of everything that we do here. And so yeah. um our, our marriage has grown stronger. Uh, because of it and um you know it's just a blessing you know to be with her every day hi this is amy from mother's cupboard home of the whole frittata we are open daily 6 a.m to 1 30 p.m for takeout orders call 315-432-0942 and tune in to wake up call with dan tortora for our monthly food challenge and try our wake up call signature menu item available seven days a week here at mother's cupboard we are central new york and it's our honor to serve you Ma and Pa's Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory remind us that every day is worth celebrating. Find them at 201 Old 7th North Street in Liverpool, New York. Open Monday through Saturday in store and all the time online at maandpazpopcorn.com. Serving our Central New York community and beyond, you can order all throughout the country at maandpazpopcorn.com. And remember to get your tins, which have in-store half-price refills forever. Ma and Pa's Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory available to you for fundraising and all of your events by calling 315-450-6272. That's 315-450-6272. Ma and Pa's Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory. How corny are you? This is Jimmer Sikowski, owner-operator of Chick-fil-A Cicero, 7916 Brewerton Road in Cicero, right in front of the Home Depot. I had a deep feeling that God wanted me to do something bigger with my life and to help people, help others. I kept putting Chick-fil-A in my life, and I realized as I was going through the franchise selection process that uh, positively impacting the lives of others was really core to what we do here at Chick-fil-A. First of all, it starts with the food. The food is brought in fresh daily, and we bring in local produce. We prepare to order in the kitchen. We hand bread our chicken. We hand spin our milkshakes. It's it's great food. It doesn't taste like fast food. I, I think the second thing is is the way people feel when they come in a Chick Fil A restaurant. It's different. We we try to treat people with intentional kindness here, which is very different and deeper than good customer service. And so, you know, I think it feels remarkable for most people to come in a Chick Fil A restaurant. And then lastly. The impact that we try to have in the community is very different. It's a big part of the expectation of every operator of a Chick-fil-A restaurant is that they're actively engaged in their community, they're a leader in the community, and they're, they're making a difference. When they realize that what we're striving to do is to shine a little light in their life, that's a very, very different experience uh, than you will have in any other quick service restaurant. And it's that remarkable experience that I think people will emotionally connect with. You talk about peaks and valleys. Relationships have peaks and valleys. How do you and your wife navigate the valleys of relation of your relationship and still love each other through tough times because I think society needs to hear that <laughs> when it's not easy, you don't just like break up and go find somebody else. Right. And, and I, I feel like in today's world, if it ain't easy, they'll just find, you know, okay, well on to the next thing. That's, that's not how real relationships are built and that's not how things last. So how do you create a lasting relationship and navigate through the valleys that come with life yeah i think i think it's with mutual respect obviously you know I, you know we love each other we mutually respect each other and appreciate each other you know i appreciate her gifts and she does amazing things that i couldn't do if i tried and she appreciates my gifts uh, that i have uh, that i've been given you know from from god and um and and you know we'll, we'll get into arguments and such but uh but um you know, we always come back to like, just be slow to anger. And, um, 
you know, walk away a little bit, let it, let it cool off a little bit. You know, we, we're different people. Like, you know, that that's, you know, we're, we love each other, but we're different. And so, yeah. um, you know, I was, I was talking to uh, our, our guys the other day and, and just talking about, you know, someday how to be a parent and, you know, number one, uh, like, Hey, get on the same page. Once you find the woman that you want to marry, get on the same page about how you're going to parent your child. You know, what, what's important to you guys? Like, what are the core values of your family going to be? Uh, I don't think there's enough people that talk about those things, you know, is God going to be at the center of that? Yeah. Um, and then number two is how do you deal with finances? You know, um, how are you going to manage your finances? And those are the really two things because, you know, people get married and then all of a sudden they're like, wow, like uh, I didn't know so-and-so was like this or, well, it's because you didn't talk about it. You know, you didn't have a, a, a common understanding about, you know, where, where your faith is, where your finances are, how you're going to raise your children, you know, what your core values are. I think if you talk about all those things and you make sure you're on the same page, you can overcome anything, man. You really can. Well, I mean, and, you bring it up and, and I'm, I'm an open book on the show. So, you know, same person on and off the air. Cause I don't, I don't even know how people can remember. Like if you're a different person on you take on a persona, how do you even remember what you said? And so, you know, being completely transparent, be growing up Catholic and going to church. I went to my priest that I had had forever and he just passed away. Monsignor Yannick, God bless you in heaven. Call him my heavenly grandpa. So love you, Monsignor. He wanted my now ex-wife. He wanted us in, in when we were thinking about getting married, he mm -hmm. wanted us to do a retreat, uh, do this thing, like go away for three days, go through this whole thing, answer all these questions, look at our answers, talk to each other about our answers and I think that we had started to do it. And I kind of looked at her and I was like, really? Like, I didn't know that about you. And I didn't know this. And I look back on things now and we didn't do the work beforehand. If I had known where she stood on so many things, I would have never married her. And mm -hmm. at the end of my relationship, when you seek an annulment, which is beyond getting a divorce and it is very spiritually challenging mm -hmm. because God, in my opinion, got me out of my relationship. And then the church was like, no, you're going back in. And I was like, mm, I think you answered to the same person mm -hmm. I answer to. That's right. And so when they were going through the process of it, you know, they have to prove that the marriage should have never happened and whatever, whatever. And I was like, you know, I didn't know her stances on kids. I, I, I knew my stance. And I think I kind of maybe pushed my stance mm -hmm. and, you know, about, and the thing is most of the women that I've ever dated my entire life, I'm the guy who has really, I have a relationship with God. I bring God into the relationship. They don't. So then sometimes they leave with a relationship with God that came from a relationship that they saw I had with God. Mm -hmm. But then there's, I dated a girl who, you know, believed in God and she was jealous of my relationship with God because God was her job and God is my dad. And so mm -hmm. there was a difference in how, like, I had this close oh, personal, sure. yeah, I had this bond with God and she had like, you know, I work in the church and I do this at school and I have to tell everybody all the rules, the rules, the rules. And I was like, God and I don't go through the rule book every day. We just talk. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that you are so open about your faith because you and I can talk about this. Right. We could talk about God. And I want to go to something that you said, though. You said, I get to watch my players date and we get to have these conversations like, do you like her? What do you like about her? Start talking about things that are important. But you said when they break up or they go through tough times, it affects them in the game. That's never talked about. I don't know if I've ever watched a broadcast where someone has really spoken. Maybe they will if Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey have a bad day. Maybe they did with Jessica Simpson and Tony Romo. But 99.9, mm -hmm. .9, by the way, did, Jessica Simpson never got this much publicity. And they're like, well, Taylor Swift. No, 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 no. Jessica Simpson is a gorgeous human being. Let her have her flowers, by the way. And I have to get this out because I'm really super frustrated about this in a joking fashion. Taylor Swift was in the booth on Sunday night football with the Chiefs and the Jets. Do you know who else was there? They were acting like she was around a bunch of people that know Blake Lively 
Mm-hmm. Ryan Reynolds, Hugh Jackman, Wolverine and Deadpool are in the booth and they're showing them and none of the people are saying anything. They're like, look at Taylor Swift, talk to these total strangers that she doesn't know. Like, I mean, it was so aggravating. Blake Lively, gorgeous human being, Ryan Reynolds. If she was single, I would have called her. Ryan Reynolds, Hugh Jackman, ridiculousness that they didn't announce them. But Mm -hmm. to bring it all together, because I thought about this, if they ever break up, Travis Kelsey, you're going to get a song and it's going to be a hit. You're not going to want to listen to it. Yep. But how how do you tackle that? Because nobody discusses that. I don't. I've never heard anybody in the media talk about the fact that that these players are human beings. These men and women, these boys and girls, are human beings. And when they go through breakups and things at home and problems with their parents and their siblings, and they had to move that all this stuff can affect them on the fields and courts of life. And and we just never discuss it. Yeah. I mean, you guard against it as much as you can, but it's like, you know, it's almost like we have a sixth sense here, man, not, not sick, but sixth Uh, because you start to see a player, uh, you know, student athlete who maybe doesn't perform in practice. You're like, man, what's going on with that dude? Like something wrong there. And like, you start to peel back the layers, right. Just kind of like an onion. And, um, and then you get to the root of the problem, right? And it's, you know, then it's like, okay, football coach, all right, we're taking this hat off. All right, here comes psychology or love doctor or, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. So I, hey, I know I can do some other things if I can't coach football someday. Uh, but um, jokingly, and, and you know, it's it, it's a moment of like, it's a moment of such power and, and it's a moment of such just like, um, understanding because I get to listen. I don't, I I tell the guys, I'm not here to fix you, right? You're, you're imperfectly perfect. Right. And so, um, and, and I just try to uplift them, you know, and nobody likes to be rejected, especially when people are told, you know, well, you're the man because you're an athlete and you can do this and you are him and all this other jazz that our society puts on these guys or these women, yeah. And, um, you know, they, they don't understand, man, today's society or young people, they don't know how to deal with conflict. They've never failed at anything in their lives, right? They've been sheltered. They've been able to turn the Xbox off. Trophy they've been society. able to, yeah, their parents have been, have said, Hey, Johnny's never going to be, you know, even if he finishes fifth, he's getting the medal. Right. So like when they, when they, when they're not on the dress list, when they're not playing, when they're uh, and, and they have their whole identity rooted in that. And then, you know, they feel great one day because they've got their arm around a gal. And then the next day she's like, deuces, I'm out of here. They can't handle it. They have no idea how to process it. And um, and that's where we talk a lot about faith. We talk a lot about just being human. Um, I let them say what they want to say in my office. It's very emotional. Um, And I try to get them back to believing, you know, in their God gifted ability and, and, and what, what was intended and how they played. And sometimes I'll pull out an old video and say, this is how you used to play, man. Like, look at this, you see the difference. Yeah. And, and so um, I just try to help them through that. And because I know, I mean, I was young once too, man, (laughs) you know, it wasn't, it wasn't always, you know, rainbows and unicorns. So, uh, but that, that is a, it's a challenge. I've had multiple, you know, multiple conversations just in the first five weeks of this year of the season with either relationships with, with women, uh, relationships with parents and talking to them about like the fact that the pressure that they're putting on their children is difficult and, and unrealistic. And so um, at the very, the very least, like all we can do is our best, like, you know, player one can't run as fast as player two. That's okay. But we're trying to extract the very best out of people. And there's a process to that. But in our society, all we care about is the product. That's a challenge. Yeah. And you, I mean, you brought it up. We're in a transactional society. Yeah. Very true. We're in a society of what can you give to me? Don't worry about what I can give to you. That's not important. What can you give to me? And when I'm done taking from your ATM, I'm going to go to the next ATM and I'm going to go to the next ATM. 
So you, we brought up a bunch of topics, transactional society, trophy society. And, and, and what I mean by trophy society is people say, cause I work with a lot of businesses and they're like, I just trained somebody for two weeks, came into my restaurant, needed a job. I trained them, spent all this time with them. First day they didn't show up or they showed up. And they said, I'm not making the sandwich that way. And you say, well, this is how we make the sandwich. And they tell the boss, the owner, yeah, I'm not going to do that. What are you going to do about mm-hmm. it? You need my help. You need me here. You need me more than I need this stupid job. I can go back on unemployment. Yep. And, and people say, how did this happen? And I say, we saw it happening. We gave trophies, not all of us, because Lord knows when I was coaching, I did not. And I did not take anything that I didn't feel like I had deserved or earned because I got a trophy at the end of the year. My team went, I think we went two, four and something. Mm -hmm. I coached soccer. I think we were like two, four and two or something like that. And it was my first season doing it. And they gave me a trophy. And I was like, what did I get a trophy for? And they're like, it's not a trophy. (laughs) They're like, it's. I don't even know if it's in here. No, it's not. So because the only trophies I have in here are championships. But they said, uh, they said, it's not a trophy. It was like an honor thing. Thanking you for being the coach. I said, okay, that's fine. But I don't want a trophy for being two, four and two. I don't want a trophy for being eight. No, because in my head, I'm thinking about, okay, how do we get to nine and zero now? Are you in the playoffs? What are we doing? So here's the thing. This is what I mean by the trophy society. Nobody should be surprised at the world we live in today mm-hmm. in America. I'm going to nope. tell you why. Because you gave these kids trophies for being in 15th place. Oh, Timmy, Timmy played soccer. No, he didn't. Timmy went and picked up worms and ate a couple of them during the soccer game. Yeah, but he was on the field and he tried, Daniel. No, he didn't. So Timmy gets a trophy. The 15th place soccer team that's 0-11 and and the 11-0 soccer team got the same trophy. It looks exactly the same. One says champion, one says participation but they look identical to each other. Everybody goes home with a trophy. If you want to know why society is detached, not em- not empathetic, don't seem to care, seem to be numb to things, don't work hard for things, don't feel like they have to be responsible or they have to earn anything in their life, that is because the kids that are in college now mm-hmm. and the kids that are in the workforce now are the kids you gave trophies to for doing mm-hmm. absolutely nothing but walking and standing on the court or the field. Yeah, I think that, I think that's a part of it. You know, that I think we've lost a little bit of what team sports is. Um, it's this coming coming together uh, to try to accomplish a goal. And you know, you have guys that are stars. You have guys that are glue guys. You have guys that are hard workers. Uh, they, you know, they the, the the main thing you take away is the relationship. I understand the win at all costs. Hey, we have to win football games, man, for me to stay here. Uh, I, I get that. That's the barometer. And so, you know, but like I was at, I was at two division one schools. I won't name the names uh, over the spring, you know, um, doing some professional development and, you know, one has a, a legitimate opportunity to be in the college football playoff and one will never be in the college football playoff. So what's, I mean, what, what, what's the, you know, what's the standard here? What are we trying to get to, you know, what, what's the expectation? And so um you know, there, there's a lot of that obviously going on in college football. And, um, you know, I, and I also think part of it is, Dan, you know, I was looking down at my phone here because I, I have a couple of, of notes, but like all the things you talked about, man, are all in a lot of pieces about the Ten Commandments, Yeah. right? Thou shall not steal. You put on the news, which I don't watch anymore, to be honest with you, because I don't need to watch it. And you see people looting and stealing in their own communities, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, we got people bickering over politics and other items. You know, uh, thou shalt not kill. Honor thy father and mother. I mean, kids don't even do that now anymore. Yeah. So like all these pieces are a generational piece and a society that has moved away from you know, God, Christianity, belief have tried to be their own idols. And this is the product. And you, I mean, there's another one, thou shall not covet. 
Yep. Not covet anything that belongs to that they, to your neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. You know, mm -hmm. committing adultery. Now people are like, oh no 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 no, it's not adultery. We had an arrangement. We you talked know? about this last night, Dan. You 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 legitimately and uh, you legitimately commit adultery from your eyes first, not from the act. Yeah. And so it's it's you know it's it's turning your head. It's you know looking at things in secrecy that that is that is legitimately a form of adultery. And the and the thing about that is I experienced this in my life, and it was one of the one of the many reasons why I didn't want to be in the relationship that I was in anymore. I had caught that act of adultery, and the response was. Well, I said, you cheated. And they said, well, it depends on your definition of cheating. And I said, only a cheater would say that. It depends on yep. your definition. And you just said it. It's it's from looking, it's 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 messages, it's pictures, it's secrecy. It's it, You don't have to physically do anything to do something. Avicoli's, located on the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road in Liverpool, New York, has been your trusted neighbor for decades. Located just steps from Liverpool High School, we're happy to have the Liverpool Warriors on-site, on-location broadcast at Avicoli's through Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora every single month, featuring student athletes, coaches, and administration throughout the year from Liverpool High School. Head out to Avicoli's today on the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road in Liverpool, New York, open Tuesday through Sunday for lunch, dinner, and drinks. We'd love to see you out there. And of course, you can call them at 315-622-5100 for takeout, delivery, and catering. That's 315-622-5100. And also find them on myavicolis.com. That's my A-V-I-C-O-L-L-I-S.com. Having peace of mind when you're out of town, that your furry loving friend is safe and sound, means taking them to Canine Campground. Because we all know that when it comes to the love of our pets, it goes well beyond the call of duty to make sure they're safe and sound. Right, Lily? <laughs> So take a ride to 242 Johnson Street in East Syracuse, New York, and see Canine Campground and where your dog will be staying, in the classic cabin, the executive cabin, the grand cabin, or of course, the luxury cabin, because if you know Lily, you know she loves luxury. <laughs> now you don't have to wait to the last minute to find a family member or a friend that'll take your dog for a few days. Call Canine Campground at 315-299-4013. That's 315-299-4013. Their drop-off and pick-up times are Monday through Sunday. Check K9Campground.com for more information. That's the letter K, the number 9, and campground spelled with a K, dot com. K9Campground.com. When you're going out of town, bring your dog to K9 Campground. PB&J's Lunchbox, the food truck that you love finding all throughout Central and Upstate New York, now has a street side cafe. So when you're craving their traditional favorites as well as their out-of-box amazing menu items, you can now head to 663 Old Liverpool Road in Liverpool, New York, located just minutes from the highway, the thruway, Destiny USA, and Onondaga Lake Parkway. PB&J's Lunchbox Street Side Cafe is there for you Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., serving breakfast, lunch, and and dinner all throughout the day. Get breakfast for dinner, dinner for lunch, whatever you fancy, including their award-winning grilled peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Find them at 663 Old Liverpool Road in Liverpool, New York. PB&J's Lunchbox, where we love to know what's in your lunchbox. This is a special message from 317 at Montgomery restaurant owner, Joel Carpenter. Open Tuesday through Saturday for your dining pleasure on 317 Montgomery Street in Syracuse, New York. We wanted to be a part of the re resurgence of Syracuse. We saw uh, a lot of money being put into bringing people back downtown and thought that, you know, we'd like to be a, a part of that. I love putting together a good dish where people see it, 
first, they fall in love with it, and then it tastes just as good as it looks. We want to provide the best food in Syracuse that we possibly can, and we want you to leave here talking to your family, your friends, about what you had to eat first and foremost, but also our service, and to walk out feeling like you're part of our family. I work out in the front of the house a lot, and I love walking to every single table, asking them how everything is, and people looking at me and smiling and saying, this is the most amazing short rib I've ever had. This is the most amazing filet I've ever had. And Donna is great. Sarah's amazing. Thank you for coming over and talking to us. And them, them just being truly happy for the experience that they've gotten. 317 at Montgomery Restaurant, part of the fabric of downtown Syracuse, located on 317 Montgomery Street in Syracuse, New York. Open Tuesday through Saturday for a unique and memorable dining experience. And, you know, I, I just, I find that we're just putting our energy and life into so many bad things. And, and if we just transitioned our energy allotment to God, to community, to mm -hmm. faith, to honesty, to hard work, dedication, determination, this society would change at a rapid rate because mm -hmm. love is contagious and hate is contagious. And, and it's just what we're focusing on. And I think it just has to be, you know, and, and I, I've said this, crazy people don't shut up. They never shut up mm -hmm. ever. They talk in their sleep. Mm -hmm. But but when somebody is, you know, yeah, well, I believe in God and and I, I believe in being a good person, but I'm not just going to go out there and tell people how great I am. You don't have to do that. But but speak up, speak up about God, speak up about your faith, speak up about helping other people about things that don't make sense to you. You know, I'm a broadcaster and I and I and I and and I tell people this all the time. I have a duty every turn, every time I turn the mic on to help people. Mm -hmm. Some people are like, oh, I'm a broadcaster. I like to hear my own voice. No, I go on my show so that I can learn something, so that I can share something. I learn all the time. I learned from you today. I'm going to paint a picture on how we can change society really quick. I'm going to give one example on how common sense is the silver bullet. Mm-hmm. Let's say I had a child. Let's say I had a daughter. She came home one day. She said, Daddy, I'm not a person anymore. I'm a cat. I said, baby girl, are you sure? She said, yes, Daddy. And let's say she's 14 years old. Yes, Daddy, I'm a cat. I would say, okay, give me your phone. She'd say, why? The cats don't have thumbs. They can't text. <laughs> And I need your car keys because cats can't drive. So you can't go see your friends anymore. And then she'd be like, what's for dinner? I said, well, your mother and I are having steak, but you're having catnip, honey. But I got your favorite flavor. I got steak flavored catnip for you. And when you go upstairs today, your bed's gone. There's a litter box. And when she starts screaming at me because I took her phone and I took her car and took her friends away and all this stuff, I'm going to look at my wife and be like, do you hear something? Because all I hear is meh. <laughs> and I tell you, within a half an hour, I would kill that whole I'm a cat because my teacher told me I could be one. Yeah. I mean, common sense. I mean, I tell people all the time I would either get fired from the school and then I'd sue them because of freedom of religion and all that other fun stuff. I'd either get fired or or they would go, OK, this is ridiculous. But either way, I'm going to make a difference. I tell people all the time I might run for president, not because I'm trying to win but because I want to make the change mm -hmm. because I want to call out everything. I want to call out all that's going on. Nobody's a hundred percent, right. A hundred percent of the time, not me, not you, not anybody. Yeah. And, but I come up with examples like this and then people go, you talk about God on your show. You talk about kids being cats. Well, what if someone cancels you until God tells me to come home? That is, that's not even a cancel. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as canceling to me. Okay. There are rape, rapists, murderers, thieves that not only have jobs, but they're billionaires, millionaires, mm -hmm. people that get out of, get out of jail because they knew somebody. Mm -hmm. There are bad people 
walk. I don't want to say bad people. There's people that do bad things walking the streets. If the worst thing that I do is hit you with some common sense, show you love and talk to you about God. Well, if that makes me a criminal, then sign me up. Because at the end of my life, if I'm a crime, if I'm a criminal on earth for loving God, I know that at the end of my life, I'm going to be the opposite in heaven. And I, yeah. I feel like we just don't want to offend people so much that we're letting everything pass, Joe. But how is a parent not having that conversation at home with their kid right now that I would have had with my daughter? And then you knock it out in a half an hour. You want to sit in a litter box in school, then you're going to sit in one at home. Yeah, it's a obviously touchy subject. Um, you know, um, sorry we, if I put we, you on the spot. No, no, it. not at all. We, we've, yeah. you know, we, well, like I said earlier, we, we've kind of lost the the idea of truth in our society a little bit. I use yeah. society as, a, as a, obviously a general term. It's not always, it's not all that bad, um, but. Um, you know, it used to be very black and white, and now it's very gray. Yeah. Uh, I think part of it is is um, it, you know you have a cycle of of and, and how does it how does it get turned to this way? It's really a cycle uh, or a generation that's educated this way. So this stuff was set in motion eighteen to twenty years ago. Yeah, you know, and I can't pinpoint the actual like events or anything like that because I'm not you know, I'm, I'm not there, but, um, you know, just, just being truthful and, um, and, um, you know, having an identity and rooted in what God says you are. And so, um, that, that's, that's, I mean, that's the identity I carry around with every day. So, um, I am, I am what he tells me I am not what I want to be yeah, I mean, or I'm... not what I think I am or not how I feel I am. You know, and so the one thing I told my team the other day, we had a great conversation after practice. I was very adamant. I was very, you know, um, truthful with them. I said, guys, I'm not going to change. Like, I'm always going to give you the truth. If you do a great job, if you oversee the expectation, I'm going to praise you and I'm going to heap praise on you. But when you fall short of the standard, I'm going to be critical of you and I'm going to challenge you. That's just my coaching style. That's who I am as a man. You know, and so I, I don't allow averageness. And so um, and I call it out in any little part uh, because I want them to be successful. I want them to be leaders. I don't want them to be average workers. I don't want to be average husbands. I don't certainly don't want to be average people. And so um, sometimes that that's that needs to be said, you know, and, and you can't be afraid to tell the truth, man, about the situation. And, um, you know, it's uh, I see it. I see it in our younger generations. You know, I'm 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 a grandfather of of soon to be six. So, um, you know, and I don't spend enough time, obviously, because they're out of state and I need to do a better job of that. But, uh, um, you know, how they grow up and, and what thought process they grow up with is important to me. And uh, I always see, seem like I'm I'm a little bit of the voice of uh, of truth, you know, and uh, and so um, I'm always going to keep it truthful that's uh i'm never i'm never going to change that no and i and i feel like i mean when you say and, and you say what's right right you know say like oh this is this is the right way to do things what do people say nowadays well that's that's right compared to that that's that's the right that you grew up with but yeah. the right that i grew up with, and it's like no murder is wrong stealing is wrong Punching someone in the face is wrong. Hate is wrong. There's things that are wrong. You can't argue and say, hey, you know what? Well, if somebody stole from somebody, oh, that's just because they're hungry. And it's yeah. like, no, stealing is a is a bad thing. Because if you're if your thing is, well, it's okay because I was hungry, well, then it's okay for me to take the bread you just stole from them because I'm more hungry than you are. Mm. And now we're just in this vicious cycle where nobody's eating, right. but everybody's taking. Right. And you know, I, I just, again, I feel like common sense is the silver bullet to everything that's going on today, but we're afraid to offend people. We're afraid, but what, what we've essentially done is if, if good, honest, God fearing people stay quiet, what we've essentially done is not prepare anybody for life mm -hmm. because the moment that life hits them, they're not going to know how to deal with any of it because being coddled and being put in this bubble and told that they're perfect and they can't do anything wrong and you've never sinned and you've never made a mistake. And anytime you break the rules, we'll just change the rules for you, honey. 
by doing something like that, you're creating a society that's not going to know how to handle life. And mm -hmm. so by not wanting to offend anyone, you're not preparing anybody for what's coming. I mean, I can walk around our society right now and say I have curly hair and some, some people would believe it. They'd be like, if you think you do. As long as I feel like I, as long as I feel like I have curly hair, like, man, <laughs> I can walk around. I can walk around the department store. What do you think about my curly hair? Some people will be like, you're crazy. Other people will be like, oh, that looks great. And but the thing yeah. is, is like, like you said, how, you like we can't pinpoint. How did we get there? Yeah. How well, did we get? We got there by 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 separating ourselves from the grace of God, right? Well, and, and so, and and that's what I believe. And yeah. and unfortunately, in our society, the longer this goes, where we become lazy and not willing to work, the more your jobs will be automated. And then what are you going to do? Well, and you know what? The funny thing is, is there was like one conversation about AI and then another one. And now it's like every other commercial. And I just saw a movie called The Creator. Mm -hmm. And it's about artificial intelligence. And I'm sorry to the people that may want to see it. I guess cl close your ears for a moment. But the end of the movie, human beings should feel bad for artificial intelligence. They should support it. They need to let it live. They created it. And now it's a living, it's a living being. And now we should feel bad for not wanting artificial intelligence in our lives. And we need to treat artificial intelligence with respect because it's a person, even though it's not. That was the end of the story. The end of the story was you created something that could kill you. You created something that can control you but you need to feel bad about it because human beings are are bad. We're all bad. And mm -hmm. that was the end of the movie. And, and I just sat there going, okay, so what tech company made this movie? Mm -hmm. But but the thing is, is we're like you said it, we're lazy. And laziness creates complacency. And when things can do things for you, then you get controlled easy, right? Well, I don't have to wipe my butt. Something wipes my butt. I got a bidet now. You know, I don't have to get my groceries. Someone's going to go to the grocery store, drop them bring off, to you. Sure. you know, bring them to me. Now we're going to get to a point where like, well, they're going to bring them to me and they're not going to open the door and come to the couch where I'm sitting and have it moved for four days. Well, then that's not good for me. And so laziness allows you to be controlled. And before you know it, everything is in the power of somebody else. And that's not smart. And artificial intelligence Every movie ever made about creating something that you want to be your God makes you fail immediately. It's an atrocity. It's a horrible thing. Anytime we try to play God, we lose in a big way. And totally. artificial intelligence, Joe, I mean, why are we looking for God when he's here? We keep trying True. to find him and he's right in front of our face. True. Well, that's what happens if, if uh, God, you know, if man tries to play God, yeah, you know I mean, we, we're, like I said, we're the vessels through which he creates something, not we create it, not I create it. And, um, you know, you think like that, uh, maybe man uh, will create something that will destroy himself. And so, um, I don't know, like, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be part of this future, how we navigate it's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, I, like I said, I don't think it's all bad no. in that sense. Uh, I think there's, there's, there's pieces and parts of it, but um, again, I think it comes down to identity and, and where your identity is rooted at and um, you know, and, and what God given talents that you have uh, that you can, you know, that you've been bestowed upon and that you can use in, in the greater good, man, to move, uh, move things forward. Remember we're, you know, the true believer is not living for this life. We know that we are being judged in this life by by the one, the one king. And, um, you know, the, um, the real faith comes into um, being in heaven after this life where there is no sorrow. There are no, there is no pain. There are no aches. There's brilliance and paradise and joy and peace and uh, that's, uh, that's a great future, man, to be a part of. Yeah. And so I think the, the best thing to take from this entire conversation 
is that opening up to God, even if you never have, is never the wrong decision to make. Being good to each other, working hard for what you want in your life, being responsible, being kind, being passionate, those are all good things. So be willing to step out there beyond fear. Lean on God, lean on your faith, lean not on your own understanding and stop trying to make everything artificial, become your official mm -hmm. and let God be the official official. I know we didn't come at you with a ton of football today, but okay. we, came at, we came at you with a bunch of things that have to do with every football player, every sports player and every human being on this planet and beyond is life, mental health, faith and dealing with adversity. So I thank you for listening and watching this conversation today. Joe, I know I always keep you in expanded time and I know you coach and you got so many things going on, but I can't thank you enough for your time. Thanks, uh, uh, Dan. I appreciate uh, catching up with you, man. You're doing great, great work. Um, you know, been following you. I know the, some of the projects that you're working on and, and some of the projects that are to come, man. And so just keep, uh, keep, like I said, keep manifesting, uh, those, those dreams and aspirations and, uh, it's going to come true, man, in, in the right time. Yeah, I, I definitely appreciate that. I appreciate your words and you are one of those people that will always succeed and it will show up in the wind columns in so many places of life that don't have to do with the field and that have to do with the field. So I know it's coming for you and maybe my comedy tour is coming to a, to a theater or an arena near you because amen to that you, I, i'll tell you something joe i need after all these women i dated i need cigars and scotch right now <laughs> hey we can provide that <laughs> thank you for everything all right bud have a great day you too god bless see you man